I want to begin, inshallah ta'ala, with a story uh, mentioned by Ibn Abbas in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, this collection of hadith known as the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. And this is one of the, one of the largest collections of hadith. Um, a lot of the hadith that you hear, most of them can be found in the collection of uh, Imam Ahmad. So there's a narration upon Ibn Abbas, who was the famous companion of the Prophet He mentions a story that took place, he says, in the 13th year of Islam. So 13 years after the angel Jibreel came to the Prophet and said, Iqra, said recite, right? 13 years after the message of Islam first came to the Prophet, this incident occurred. Now, just to give you some context regarding what was happening at that time, most of the Muslims had made hijrah from Mecca to Medina. As we know, the Muslims were persecuted in Mecca. It was almost impossible for them to practice their religion. They were regularly tortured. They were regularly abused. They were constantly oppressed. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a way for them to make hijrah to the city of Medina. So in the 13th year, after the coming of the Risala, after, after the coming of the message, most of the Muslims now, they have made hijrah. But still in Mecca, there is a handful of Muslims. Out of those Muslims, the most important Muslim is there. And that is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And people ask, why didn't the Prophet make hijrah along with the rest of the companions? The reason was that the Prophet was waiting for a specific commandment to come down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow him to make hijrah or to tell him that this is the time to make hijrah. And so the Prophet was waiting. Yes, the companions had been given permission. Yes, most of them made hijrah. Who remained, the people who remained in Mecca was, was the Prophet some members of his family and a few of the Sahaba. Amongst them, Abu Bakr and some, uh, and, and, and some other members of the family of the Prophet as well. Now, 13 years now, we're 13 years into Islam. The situation in Mecca is still hostile. The Quraysh, the Mushrikun, from Quraysh, they still, their top priority right now regarding Muslims and Islam is to destroy Islam. They want to get rid of the Prophet they want to get rid of Islam, they want to get rid of this, from their perception, a new religion, a religion that is just destroying or getting rid of the religion of their forefathers, right? So that is still now, so for 13 years it's been building and building and building. So the animosity started from the beginning of Islam. From the moment the Prophet went public with the message of Islam, that animosity has been building and building and building. And you have personalities like Abu Jahl, and you have personalities like Abu Lahab, who have this intense hatred for the Prophet. Right? There's nothing like it, their whole being is devoted to just destroying the Prophet. So, 13 years have passed. The Quraysh are looking at the Muslims and they realize most of them have left. So they realize that they're losing control over the spread of Islam. So according to them, they're like, listen, as long as the Muslims are in Mecca, we can control them. We can suppress the spread of Islam. We can suppress Muslims and so on and so forth. Now that the Muslims are leaving, according to them, they're losing control over how much Islam will spread. And their biggest fear now is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if he leaves, it's going to be an even bigger problem. If he leaves, then they, can, they have absolutely no control over Islam. So what they want to do at this point is they want to make sure to deal with the Prophet ﷺ while he is still in Medina because they don't know when he's going to leave. And, and, and even they understood that it's only a matter of time before the Prophet ﷺ goes and, and leaves for Medina as well. So they decide to meet the leaders of the Quraysh. They decide to have a meeting. They decide to gather. Why? What's the purpose of this? To try and figure out what to do with the Prophet. And this was a meeting known, in a, known as a place, uh, known, they gathered in a place known as Darun Nadwa. It was a very secretive meeting. Most people from the Quraysh, they didn't even know this meeting was taking place. If you basically, the way it worked was if you, if you weren't invited, then you wouldn't even know this is taking place. We only invited the people that we trust. It was the leaders of the Quraysh because they didn't want this information to get out. They didn't want someone to inform the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, or his family or his companions that they're having this secretive meeting. So they gather, as we say, and Ibn Abbas says, it was a dark night. It was a dark overcast night, right? a still night. They gather at Darun Nadwa and they all come in one by one and 
there's a person at the door who's basically guarding the door, making sure, and in our context, that'd be considered someone like a bouncer, right? So who's at the door, protecting the door, making sure the wrong people don't come in. He's at the door and he's about to lock the door because according to him, everyone who is invited is already there. As he's about to lock the door, a man sticks his hand through the door, basically signaling for him to be allowed in as well. And as he does that, they open the door to see who it is and they see that it's a man that they don't recognize. It's an old man. And they ask him, they say, who are you? Who are you? And why are you here? Because they're shocked that they're surprised that anybody would even know that this is taking place. And secondly, even if you were to know, like who would actually have the nerve, like who would actually want to or try to come into a meeting like this? I mean, this is only for the leaders of the Quraysh. This is only for the elite, elite. It's only for the powerful. And so they're surprised. They're like, who are you and why are you here? And he says, I have come from an najd And by the way, an najd is a, uh, is a part in the Arabian Peninsula. It's, it's quite a distance from, from Mecca. He says, I've come from an najd And he said, I know why you have gathered here. And perhaps I can help you in what you're, tr- in what you're trying to accomplish. Right? That's all he said. And subhanAllah, the scholars of Sirah, they say it's very interesting what happens next. It's very interesting and strange. And what happens is that even though they don't recognize who this person is, they don't know him, they've never seen him before, for some reason, they trust him. For some reason, they feel comfortable with him and they say, okay, come in. Right? They allow him to come in. He comes inside and now the meeting starts. And basically, now they're all going to give their ideas of how to take care of the Prophet. And so one man stands up and he says, well, I have an idea. He says, my idea is the way we deal with the threat of the Prophet ﷺ is that we should imprison him. We should shackle his, his hands and chain him to the ground in some, random, in some random dwelling, some random place, shackle him to the ground and imprison him. After he says that, a lot of people in the room, they, they kind of have a positive reaction towards his suggestion. They're like, yeah, we can just imprison the Prophet said him, right? Just imprison him and we're done with the threat. Until the old man who had walked in at the last moment, he stands up. And he stands up and he says, Wallahi, ma hada lakum bil ra'i. He says, I swear by Allah that this is not my suggestion for you. And now we would think that first of all, who are you to even have an objection? Right? You're not even one of the elders. Right? And who are you to even speak? And that is what should have happened. What should have happened is like one of the leaders of the Quraysh should have stood up and been like, who are you to even say anything? Sit your butt down. Right? Like, who are you? But once again, just like they trusted him to begin with, now once again they're trusting him. And so they take him seriously and they say, well, why isn't this a good idea? They ask him, they say, well, okay, what's wrong with this idea? And the old man, he says, if you were to imprison him, then most certainly the news of this imprisonment would spread. And sooner or later, his followers, his companions are going to come for us. Not only that, the tribe of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they're going to go to war with us because we have imprisoned Muhammad for no reason. And so he says, this is not the correct, this is not what we should do. Not a good idea. And everyone in the room seems to agree. He sits down. The man who had given the suggestion, he sits down. And now there's kind of like this murmur in the room. Everyone's talking to themselves. They're trying to figure out what to suggest. And another man, he has an idea. He stands up and he says, my idea is, I have the perfect suggestion. He says, why don't we expel him from Mecca? Why don't we take him to a land where no one knows who he is? where he has no family, he has no tribe, he has no supporters. We take him somewhere very, very far away and we leave him there. And he's feeling pretty good about his idea until once again, the old man stands up and says, La. He says, La wallahi, ma hada lakum bil ra'i. He says, no, I swear by Allah, this is not my suggestion for you. We can't do this. And once again, they actually take him seriously. They say, why? Why is it that we can't do this? Why, why shouldn't we take him somewhere, expel him from the lands and where nobody knows who he is and let him die, live, live out the rest of his life somewhere far, far away from us. He, and and the, the old man, he says, well, if we were to do that, 
if we were to take him somewhere else. He says, no matter where you take him, any land that you will take him to, certainly just like he was able to gather a following here in Mecca, he's going to gather a following there as well. And as a matter of fact, the situation in Mecca is horrible for him. We've made it very difficult for him to spread Islam. And still he managed to gather a following. If you take him somewhere where he doesn't have enemies, how do you know that he's not going to gather another following? And once again, we're in the same situation that we were in when we started. And he sits down. And now everybody in the room is talking, but talking to themselves. And people are almost afraid to give their suggestion now because they're thinking, well, everything that we suggest, this old man just shuts it down. And nobody's speaking now. They're speaking to one another, but nobody's speaking. Until Abu Jahl, he's had enough, right? He's sitting there, he's been waiting, and he's been kind of like, you know, moving around in his seat. And now he gets up and he's like, that's it. He stands up and he says, listen, I know all of you have given your suggestions, but how about I say what many of you are thinking, but none of you have the guts to actually say it. And they say, what, what is it? Go ahead. Yalla, tell us what you have to say. And he says, how about we just kill him? How about we just murder him? Just take his life and be done with this whole situation, right? No more figuring out what to do with him, figuring out what to do with his followers and trying to control Islam and trying to fight them. And this, this daily struggle, because listen, let's just kill him. Just get rid of him. And as he says this, this old man stands up again. And people are like, okay, here we go again, right? Another problem. And the old man stands up, and the first thing he says is na'am. He says na'am, yes. He said, al-qawlu maqala hadha rajul. He says, the correct statement is what this man has said. Right? What he said, that's what we should do. And then a suggestion is put forward, and the scholars actually differ who put the suggestion forward. Some scholars uh, say that it was Abu Jahl who said this next thing that I'm about to mention. Some scholars say it was the, it was the old man who made the suggestion. So what is this suggestion? He says, listen, not, we shouldn't just kill him, because if we kill him, you know, you know it's, it's not like they haven't thought of it before. There's a lot of problems with killing the Prophet ﷺ. For example, if, you, if they were to just kill and murder him, number one, the Prophet ﷺ has a tribe backing him up. And to kill someone like that is, is, is just blatantly calling for war, right? And they don't want to go to war right now. They don't, they don't want to just open the door for war. They're like, that's not a good idea. Also, the fact that the companions of the Prophet ﷺ will want to go to war as well, right? It's going to be a big problem. So this suggestion of killing, he says, listen, we're not going to just kill him. We have to kill him in a way that we can get away scot-free. He says, what we should do is we should gather one representative from each of the major tribes. So, you know, they're sitting in this gathering and there's a representative from all the tribes. We gather one person from all the tribes and he said, perhaps a young person, perhaps a young person. They go together to go murder Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa right? And what that accomplishes, and he says also, when they murder him, uh, what should happen is that they should use one dagger, one knife, and the blood that comes from Muhammad وسلم, should fall on the clothes of each and every one of the young men. What that accomplishes now is that there's not one person responsible. Pretty much all of the tribes are now responsible. And the tribes, well, he said, listen, what we're going to say at that point is, listen, we didn't sanction this. We weren't okay with this. These were just some young, overzealous men who, who got fired up and they, we don't condone this behavior, right? This is, it's just a young person who got overzealous and he went and tried to kill, they killed Muhammad. And so he said, when we do that, then it is impossible for the tribe of the Prophet ﷺ to go to war with like eight, nine, 10, 11, or 12 tribes. It's not gonna happen. The only choice that they will have is to accept the blood money for that murder. Right? Yes, it was, they'll, they'll say, well, admit, it was a mistake, we didn't mean to do it. These young, as you said, these young people got overzealous, uh, you know, uh, so we will gladly give you the blood money for this unjust murder of Muhammad. And he says that they will have no choice but to accept the blood money because they're not going to go to war with 12 tribes. It's not going to happen. And he says, in that way, and he says, money's, money, by the way, money was never an issue for the Quraysh. They would have given any amount of money to get rid of the Prophet ﷺ. So this money was never an issue. He's like, we give the money, we're done with and they all decide that that is what they should do. 
So on that night, in the 13th year of the coming of the Prophet ﷺ, coming of the message of Islam, they decide to murder the Prophet ﷺ. So what happened? What happened is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the angel Jibreel to attend that gathering at Darul Nadwa. And the angel Jibreel, he was there, he witnessed what happened, he heard what happened, and then he immediately goes to the Prophet ﷺ, who at this point, Prophet ﷺ doesn't know that they're plotting his murder. Especially that they're plotting his murder and they decided to murder him that very night. That very night they decided, we're not going to wait. We're not going to say, listen, you know, let's wait a week and plan it out. And all. They said, listen, we need to do this right away. So we made this plan right now. A couple hours from now, let's go to his house and let's murder him. So the angel Jibreel goes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, you are waiting for a specific command from Allah for specific permission from Allah to come to allow you to make hijrah, now is the time. So leave now. And the Prophet ﷺ gathered his belongings, he gathered his stuff, and as we know, Abu Bakr ﷺ, he actually accompanied the Prophet ﷺ on his journey to uh, Medina. He leaves his house, and get this, those 10 or 12 men who are there, bloodthirsty, ready to kill the Prophet ﷺ, they're standing right in front of him. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ knows why they're there. What would you have done if that happened to you? You walk out of your house and you see a group of 10 men or 12 men, young men, they have a knife in their hand and you know they're about to murder you. What would you have done? You would probably run back in your house, close the house, like lock your doors and just like make serious dua, right? Or be like, oh Allah protect me. Something, you, you would have freaked out. I would have freaked out, right? If you know somebody's there to mur murder you, the average reaction would be to freak out. You know what the Prophet Sallam did? He walked right up to them. He picked up sand from the ground and he sprinkled it on top of their heads. In the time of the Arabs, of the, the Jahadi Arabs, to throw dirt, uh, dirt or dust on somebody's head, that is a, that's like, you're, you're about to throw it down, right? You're like, yalla, let's go. Like, we, we're going to go at it. Why did the Prophet ﷺ take that action? Did the Prophet ﷺ know that they cannot see him? Yes or no? Hmm. What do you guys think? Okay, I'll just clarify this. They couldn't see him, right? They couldn't see him. But did the Prophet ﷺ know that they couldn't see him? Yes or no? He didn't know. The Prophet ﷺ didn't know. However, what the Prophet ﷺ knew is that Allah would protect him because the permission has come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If Allah has told him to leave, to go, this is the time to make hijrah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect him. And we know this, the ayah in Surah Yasin, which many of us recite, this is, and a lot of the scholars of tafsir, they mentioned that this ayah is talking about this very incident where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا that we put before them a barrier, right? The people who are there to murder the Prophet we put a barrier in front of them and we put a barrier behind them and we covered them, meaning we covered their sight they're not able to see, right? Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of this incident that took place but it was the firm iman of the Prophet wasallam, in which, yes, he found out that they're not able to see him when this ayah was revealed upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? But at that moment, he had trust in Allah subhanahu wa taala to protect him, right? And the, as we know, the angel Jibreel came and told Prophet sallam. And as we know, the rest of the story, the rest is history. The Prophet sallam went through their ranks, right through sprinkled, as we said, sprinkled sand on their heads, walked through their ranks, and made his hijrah and escaped to Al Madina. Now, question being. Who was the old man who put all of this in motion? Right? Shaytan? The devil? Is this an authentic story? Like the devil just showed up and is like, yeah, let's murder the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Yes or no? This is an authentic narration. Right? And the scholars don't differ over the fact that it was actually, it was the shaytan. It was the shaytan in the form of a man.